JBN, we keep you informed. I am Michelle Jones, and in the news, two arrested following Mandela Highway are fined. A man and a woman are now in police custody after 100 rounds of 7.62 mm ammunition were seized in a joint anti gang task force operation on Friday. According to information released by both the Jamaica Defense Force and the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the ammunition was seized on Mandela Highway in the vicinity of the Caymanos crossing. Reports are that the task force were conducting targeted patrols in the area when a vehicle was signaled to stop. The actions of the occupants arose the suspicion of the officers, which led to the vehicle being searched and the ammunition found. Investigations are ongoing. Bartender found dead at guest house in St. Anne. The runaway Bay Police in St. Anne are probing the death of a man whose body was found inside his room at a guest house. He has been identified as 30-year-old Roshane Andrew Clark, a bartender of Spicy Hill District in Trelawney. Reports that Clark was employed at Sharky's Seafood Restaurant and Bar in St. Anne. It is reported that he left work on Friday night and failed to report for duties the following day. Contact was then made with the operators of Salem Resort, where he was staying. Checks were made and Clark was found face down on his bed inside his room. The police were summoned and checks revealed reportedly that his right hand was bound behind him. He said it was also wrapped in a piece of cloth. According to the police, there were no visible signs of injuries on the body. The police have yet to establish a motive for the killing. Never shoots uncle in alleged dispute over land. A man who allegedly shot and injured his uncle at Red Ground, Negrilling Westmoreland, is now in police custody. According to information received, the man, on Sunday, shot his uncle in the right side of his head and buttocks allegedly over an ongoing land and water dispute. According to the police, the injured man was sitting on his veranda at home when he was confronted by the suspect who is his nephew. The perpetrator is alleged to have said, A long time I warn you, before pulling a gun from his waistband. The man was chased by his nephew, who opened gunfire at him, hitting him to the right side of his head and in his buttocks. The victim was assisted to the Savram Hospital by the paramedics, where he was admitted in stable condition. The suspect was later apprehended by the police in the Negril Bus Park. Lucky to be alive, untenable. That's how Jamaica Teachers Association JTA President Lausanne Harrison has described the security crisis in rural schools, where she said principals have assumed the role of guards, calling for ups in violence. Harrison has blamed the absence of fencing and a watchman at retirement primary in St. Elizabeth for the savage attack on the school's principal and Marie Robinson Terrellong last Friday. Robinson Terrellong sustained three machete wounds to the head from a man known as Chris on the school compound. The accusers reportedly behaved in boisterous at the school on Thursday and had allegedly threatened a cook and gardener employed at the facility three weeks ago. The principal, who was admitted to Black River Hospital, remains in stable condition. I am lucky to be alive, Robinson Terrellong, an educator for 35 years, said from a hospital bed Sunday. Education Minister Favel Williams urge administrators and security personnel to be careful when interfacing with trespassers. Williams said she was shocked and horrified by the report. This attack on a member of the school community is highly distressing. We want our schools to be safe environments for students, teachers and support staff. And this reprehensible attack undermines all the efforts being made to create safe spaces for the school community, said Williams in a statement issued Sunday. At the same time, I'm urging school staff to exercise caution when confronting unauthorized persons who have entered your campuses. You do not know their state of mind or the extent to which they may be armed. It is better to summon the help of the security forces. Counseling services have been offered to staff and students. The JTA president expressed support for Monday's planned nationwide protest by teachers who will wear black to show disapproval of violence against teachers. Colleagues, if there was ever a time we need to unite and serve, it is now, said an appeal being circulated on social media. Harrison Sitch was concerned about the impression that educators were trained as karate specialists. We're expected to stand in the gap, whether it be our students who are enraged or an intruder from our community. We're expected to solve these problems. It certainly cannot continue as is, Harrison said. The attack happened the day after the Ministry of Education launched an anti-violence campaign in schools tackled Just Meds It. The retirement principal says she has for some time appealed for the school to be fenced and hopes that the attack will spark action. Approximately 70 students are enrolled at the multi-grade facility. She said her attacker does not have a child attending the school and is not a member of staff. 
My school is not near to the road, so you're not passing there to go anywhere, she said. Robinson Tarolong said she asked the man to leave the compound, but he reportedly started arguing that the quality of tutelage at the school was not up to standard. In the middle of telling him to get off the school compound, he punched me in the face, so I used the machete I had in my hand to try to defend myself, but he beat me on my right arm. I fell and he took away the machete and used it to chop me in my head, said Robinson Tarolong. She said the day before the attack, the entire school had to seek cover because of his alleged misconduct. Our students are now traumatized, she stated. Royal Reed and Fritz Pinnacle's Privy Council bid to have corruption charges dropped. Corruption accused former Education Minister Royal Reed and ex-president of the Caribbean Maritime University, CMU Fritz Pinnock, have lost their bid to have the Privy Council. Jamaica's final appellate court dismissed the charges against them. The men have been contending that the Financial Investigations Division, FID, which charged them, did not have the authority to do so. Last week, the UK-based court refused the men's application to appeal the issue, ruling that the Jamaica Parish Court, where the case was first brought, should decide whether the FID has the authority. Attorney Wildman, who represents Reed and Pinnock, on Monday, said that his clients will go ahead with their case or judicial review of the decision of Senior Parish Judge Chester Crooks that the trial in the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court should proceed. Both the Jamaican Full Court and the Court of Appeal had ruled that the legal challenge against the FID should be made in the Parish Court. The Court of Appeal is second to the Privy Council. After the Court of Appeal refused an application in November 2021 for the men to go to the UK, they applied directly by way of a special leave in an effort to have the charges dropped. Reed, his wife Sharon, their daughter Sherelle, along with Pinnock and Jamaica Labour Party Council Kimbron Lawrence, are facing fraud and corruption charges involving nearly $50 million diverted from the Ministry of Education and the CMU for their personal use. They were arrested in October 2019 and have their bails extended on October 3 to return to the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on January 9, 2023. Senior Parish Judge Chester Crooks had ruled in February 2021 that the trial should proceed after the accused applied for the case to be dropped, claiming that the FID had no authority to arrest and charge them. Following the ruling, Crooks recused himself because of conflict of interest. He attended Monroe College, St. Elizabeth, when Reed was head boy. Reed and Pinnock are asking the Judicial Review Court to quash Crooks' decision because of conflict of interest. The hearing is set for February 6 and 7, 2023. Supreme Court Judge Courtney Day in June last year altered the trial pending the review of the Judicial Review Court. The FID sought to have the stay overturned, but Supreme Court Judge Andrea Pettigrew Collins said she had no authority to do so. The matter is now before the Court of Appeal as the FID is appealing the ruling. PM Holness tries to appease residents of East Central St. James following massive roadblock. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has sought to assure residents of East Central St. James who blocked roads in the constituency on Monday morning that the government understands their frustration and the situation is being addressed. The residents mounted a massive roadblock in the constituency which stretched from Friendship into the town of Montego Bay. They were protesting for improved road conditions. This is not the first time residents have mounted a roadblock to press their Member of Parliament Edmund Bartlett to address road conditions in their communities. PM Olness speaking this afternoon. I have been noticing that there is an, an increase in the number of demonstrations and, and protests. It's a part of our democracy. I appreciate it. I pay attention to every one of them behind the scenes. Whenever I see one, I say, Minister Warmington, what's the situation? How fast can we move to resolve it? I don't want my Jamaican brothers and sisters to feel that they are out there in the rural parts of the country and government doesn't pay attention to them. That's why we're here this morning. Because as I speak, I know that there is a, a demonstration along this corridor that we are speaking of uh, in St. James. Uh, Minister Bartlett will tell you that this has been on Cabinet's agenda uh, of discussion at least four times as to how we can uh, treat with this matter. So we have made allocations. We've done it in three phases because, phases because we, we couldn't do it at once. If we did it at once, it would cost probably about $1.5 billion to do that 19 kilometers of roadway. So that means several other communities in Jamaica could not be attended to. So we had to do it in small pieces. Today we are doing 167 
million dollars for 1.6 kilometers of road. Road fatalities pushed to 362 since January, says RSU. Two women, a 61-year-old pedestrian and a 45-year-old driver of a private motor car, were listed among the seven people who perished in motor vehicle crashes between the period of October 15 to 21. The latest fatalities have pushed the total number of people who have died on the nation's roads since the start of the year to 362, according to the latest statistics released on Friday by the Road Safety Unit, RSU. The five males who died during the one-week period under review include a 17-year-old boy who died after the motorcycle he was driving collided with a Toyota Tony's along the town in Maid Road in Westmoreland on Saturday, October 15. Following the crash, the teenager was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. In total, two pedestrians, three motorcyclists, one driver of a commercial motor car and the driver of a private motor car died in traffic crashes over the seven-day period. Meanwhile, the 362 road deaths recorded up to October 21 resulted from 315 fatal crashes, the RSU said. The unit said fatal crashes have decreased by 5%, while fatalities are down 2% when compared to the corresponding period in 2021. The RSU highlighted that at the start of the year, fatalities of 2022 were projected to decrease by 8%. However, the projection as of the second quarter projects a decrease of 2%. A total of 487 people were killed in traffic crashes in 2021. In the meantime, pedestrians account for 20% of all road deaths to date, with motorcyclists accounting for 30%. Private motor vehicle drivers account for 20% of all fatalities, and private motor vehicle passengers account for 14%. The group of road users classified as most vulnerable pedestrians, pedal cyclists, motorcyclists, and pillions account for 57% combined since the start of the year. Males continue to account for 85%, with females accounting for 15% of victims of road fatalities. In sports news, JPL season kicked off last evening. One of last season's losing semi-finalists, Waterhouse FC, passed a stern test on Sunday night when they were pushed all the way by Mullins United before running out to one winners in their season opener in the Jamaica Premier League at the Anthony Spalling Sports Complex. A second off some striker Devroy Gray helped Waterhouse come from a goal down to beat a determined Mullins United team 2-1 and earn three points to start the season. Sharon De Green got the Mullins consolation goal. Based on the position the two teams finished in last season, Waterhouse were considered favourites to win, but it was Mullins who started the brighter of the two. Over at Jocks Hall, the Theodore Whitmore era coach of Mount Pleasant got underway with a hard fought come from behind 2 1 win over Augusta promoted Falkland FC team. Goals from Trevante Stewart and Leonardo Gypsy in the final 23 minutes saved Mount Pleasant some blushes after Hosanna Johnson gave Falkland FC a shock lead in the 22nd minute. The dismissal of Falkland FC's defender Joel Powell after he was shown a second yellow card in the 72nd minute and an injury to the other central defender, Captain Michael McLeod, shifted the balance decisively to Mount Pleasant and they took advantage. Meanwhile, Vera United came away with a 1-1 home draw against Evelyn Gardens at the Wembley Center of Excellence. Vera, who had just 12 players at their disposal for the match, started the new campaign sprightly and duly got the opening goal in the 13th minute through Ricardo Dennis. The German Johnson coach Evelyn Gardens had to wait until the 77th minute to get the equalizer against the Tyrion Vera when Diego Mendes rifled home a right footer from inside the area. JBN, we keep you informed. Please remember to subscribe, like, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily news items.